Welcome. Monthly ESEA office hour. Today is July 9th. Hello, summer. The weather today is presenting itself very nicely. Hopefully you folks all have an opportunity to enjoy yourselves. As you might be able to tell, I am a new face to the ESEA team. I have joined this team last week as their uh, federal programs director. My name may be familiar to some of you as I used to live in ESEA before moving to the emergency relief funds, but just wanted to give you folks an update that we are here to support the ESEA team as well as the field. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to your point of contact. Um, and I'll let Jess kind of update you as it relates to point of contact for the regions within her, her parameters. Awesome, yeah, so I am going out on maternity leave, maybe Friday, that is her due date, we will see. Um, so when that happens, I will change my out of office message. For those of you who are in my Aroostook County region, the point of contact will now be Shelly for that. And for Kennebec, the point of contact will be Jeanette. So I just recommend if you're emailing me this week, CCing them on the email and you'll know as soon as I'm out of office because the, the message will change. So um, hopefully that will help us transition over. Okay, and I'm gonna keep going strong here with Title I uh, Equitable Service Data Collection Process Change. Um, so we've been using the Qualtrics survey uh, where non-publics submit an Excel sheet um, and we use that information to calculate proportional shares for um, ESEA Title I services. Um, for FY26, so for next year, we're going to be implementing a new collection process for Title I, and non-publics will be submitting student enrollment data in NEO. So that will open October 1st, and they should be submitting it by October 30th. We will be giving more information on this and recommending trainings um, as soon as we have it. Um, available for you. And we'll also be releasing that information when we have it to directly to non-public school data specialists. Um, so please feel free to sh share it with your contacts and we will also be sharing it through um, to them as well. We also heard back finally about the tidings amendment. So we did get a tidings amendment waiver, which will extend those FY23 funds for another year. And then we also got the FY24 Title I Part A excess carryover waiver. So what that means is if you want to apply to carry over over 15% of Title I carryover in your performance report that's coming up in November, um, we are able to grant you a waiver even if you had one in the past three years. We do want to note if you opt into that waiver, you will not be eligible again until FY27. So um, again, you can only take that waiver every three years. It doesn't apply this year. So if you had it last year, you can get it again. We got an exception, um, but did want to note that. Um, and there are some notes here. If you have a SIG school, you'll want to look more closely at those notes as well, because it only applies to FY24 SIG application for those 13 schools who were unable to exit Tier 3 status. Great. Good morning, everyone. Just another friendly reminder as folks are deeply within the ESCA application season that your FY25 skeleton is on grants for me there. Um, you navigate it with funding to the funding applications. And there is that drop down that you can see all of yours, 23, 24. And this is obviously going to be now uh, nestled under FY25. Uh, 2025 will be the year you would use for the drop down. You do need to change it to draft started for it to be editable. And remember that those statuses are always at the top of the sections page of the grant. Um, please note that final allocations will not be uh, uploaded into grants for me until the 12th. 
it has sent that message for folks who are so on top of it that they've tried to submit with the preliminary numbers. Um, it's telling you you can't, which you can't because there may be a few dollars more or less. Um, and so that will be very um, important next week as you come back to the office on Monday um, to finalize that. You have two weeks till it's due or think about maybe even more than that a bit, but due August 1st. Um, and that's every year. It's always due August 1st. Um, and you'll want to submit it by clicking draft complete it. It is going to go through a workflow with your principals, LEAU, reviewing the budgets. It will go to your business manager and it will go to your superintendent. So just be very aware that if um, you're trying to get that application in on time, you want it reviewed, all of that does need to occur, especially important that this is the first time your whole leadership team is seeing the application. So give folks time to review it and understand it and have all be on the same page. I know there are some districts, especially some island schools that do refuse funding. Um, please go into the application, log in and refuse those funds. That helps maintain fidelity with the grant in terms of not receiving notifications and not feeling like you have a lot of things that you need to do when you don't um, with an application because you you won't get the, oh, you started a draft and you have to uh, complete it. You won't get those because you're actually in the correct status for that. So that's important. Um, and of course, it's very important to understand what substantial approval means when it comes to an application and when you can start obligating funds. Essentially, your application has to receive that substantial approval status. And if you're wondering what that means, it's always really beneficial to take a look at the consultant checklist. It's one of the pages listed on the sections. And obviously, for folks who are veterans here, you know that's where the notes, uh, when we return them for additional edits, that that's where they all live. And so it's those first 16 items, in parentheses, you'll see substantial approval. Um, when you receive that date, that's when you can begin obligating those funds. Um, the other sort of bottom half of the consultant checklist is final approval, when invoicing can begin. So it's just really important to maintain sort of the health and integrity of this application is to really understand the consultant checklist um, and to understand what's required um, especially for, for certain districts that really need this FY25 funds available as soon as possible, please take some time to really understand what you will be reviewed, what the application is reviewed. Um, we do have resources on our site and on the Grants for Me part of our, um, of our website as well. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a bit about a few updates this year. Um, well, one thing too before that is that the FY25 ESEA applications, uh, for some folks, they do uh, request pre-award costs. If you have expenses that fall between July 1 and the date in which you receive substantial approval, you can apply for pre-award costs. And you can see it's under the allocation section. Um, requests must be specific in nature as well as being reasonable, allocable, and necessary. Um, and this is a big caveat. In order to be eligible for pre-award costs, you have to turn in that application into uh, the LEA authorized rep approved. So it's gone through the workflow by August 1. Um, and one thing before we move on to this, I'm going to put this in the chat in a moment, but there are a few minor changes to the FY25 application after our USDE monitoring uh, findings. So I will drop that document. It is on the Grants For Me homepage on our website. Um, and I do think it'd be, especially for folks here who have family engagement funding, a reservation project, um, and for those that work with Head Start or any coordinating of pre-K, at least for Title I, those are important uh, new narrative boxes to understand how your regional program manager will be reviewing those. Uh, you'll see they are embedded in the consultant checklist. Um, so I will drop that document and it was added to the newsletter, the monthly updates. So I'll drop that in um, and make sure that at least folks that are turning in an FY25 ESEA application this year, at least understand the few additional things that are in there that were not in there from previous years. Oh yes, address books. <laughs> Uh, I know there are roles changing and folks are moving from district to district or are changing their roles overall. Um, it's really, really, really important that um, you have one LEA authorized representative in the address book, two user access administrators in case one leaves or is unable to do something in a moment. 
um, one ESCA consolidated application director that shouldn't be any of the other roles. Um, for those needing additional uh, access, it's you can absolutely make folks, you can add their emails to LEA ESCA consolidated application update. They can essentially see the application at any time, take a look at budgets and things like that, but are not able to edit and revise. Just important that there are internal controls in a workflow um, for the changing of these funds and for projects, et cetera. So please have your address books updated, please, please, please. Rita, I just yeah. wanted to add that um, I'm getting a lot of questions about the SIG application for FY25. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. This needs to be done for the FY25 SIG application too. It's two separate applications. They don't talk to each other. So you want to make sure that you're in the FY25 SIG application and not in the ESCA consolidated application. And you have to do all of this in the address book. I'm getting a lot of questions about that. Um, and the user access guide actually walks you through this too. So um, there are resources out there. This is also me. Okay, so this is this is like the third or fourth reminder, but it's just majorly important that um, for non-public equitable services, you understand there's a new form. We had a training. That training is linked on the form. There's actually an assurance that the non-public leader has to watch that or have attended that. Um, again, we're really getting into this uh, desire here to have things standardized. So have all of your non-public leaders that you work with be on the same page about requirements, about uh, carrying over funds and how those are only during extenuating circumstances. So we went through that with slides, we did a training. So it's very, very, very important um, this year that that new form is what is used for consultation. Um, and that is online, but and as well as uploaded in grants for me. Shelly? So as Rita mentioned, we do have some resources available on our page, but we wanna draw your attention to the resources associated with the funding application webinars. So there is a resource page off of the ESEA site that provides a pop out, particularly on the right-hand side, you can see the funding application webinars. We do walk through all of the information associated with the FY25 consolidated ESEA application. And this is a wonderful resource before reaching out to your regional program manager uh, with questions. Also, uh, on the theme of friendly reminders, we wanted to remind you folks that as you're developing your plan and use of funds for the ESEA title programs, you want to be sure that you're providing an opportunity for the public to provide feedback on the use of funds and the way in which needs have been identified. So making sure that you incorporate those comments in your final application is critical, but also in addition, making sure that you provide ample time for uh, stakeholders to be able to provide any comments as appropriate to the plan. The other component is really being sure that you're using your CNA or your comprehensive needs assessment to drive the priorities as well as to identify areas that you want to grow and utilize title funding to be able to do that. So again, making sure you're reviewing the needs analysis, the, the CNA, and also identifying the data sources, making sure that they've been updated and providing information of when all of these reviews and uh, revisions have been conducted is extremely important as it relates to the FY25 ESEA application. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tyra Corson, and I am the ESEA management analyst who uh, reviews all your invoices for ESEA funds. I just want to um, dive a little deeper into what Rita was saying regarding your substantial approval date for your FY25 uh, funds. So just be mindful that you cannot obligate 
So an obligation is defined in Edgar 2 CFR 200 76.707. And one of the questions that we keep getting asked is about contracts. And just because the work is not going to take place until October, for, for an example, doesn't mean that you didn't obligate those funds by entering into a legal binding contract at an earlier date. So please make sure that you're not entering into contracts at this time until you have a substantial approval date or pre-award costs have been uh, approved. And just a reminder that subscriptions must be initiated or, or obligated and used during the period of performance for a grant. So subscriptions cannot extend more than 27 months. Um, that is the same with access licenses. Some of you have received rejected invoices because the um, kits come with three-year access licenses or six years I've seen. So just keep that in mind when you are um, purchasing subscriptions or licenses. Uh, invoicing, as always, it needs to be reasonable, necessary, and allocable. And um, allocable means that it needs to align with your high needs area align to your application for funds uh, as well. And reasonable is basically just using common sense. Like what is the average price for let's say transportation for a field trip? We need to make sure that these are reasonable costs. Uh, important dates, as I said before, the substantial approval date in the period of performance for the grant. Uh, salaries and benefits. If you are um, using up old funds, let's say you're using the remainder of your FY23 funds and you're going to split the invoice with FY24, you must request reimbursement for both salaries and benefits on both of the invoices. It can't just be, I'm going to ask for 3,000 in benefits on one, and then I'm gonna ask for the salaries on the other. And this is, like I said, this is uh, true when splitting an invoice to use up old funds. Grants for me errors, um, I have, rejected invoices that have only asked for um, salaries or they have only asked for uh, supplies and the, the error is you don't have enough budgeted there to absorb the, let's say the benefits, right? So don't just put if you get an error saying you don't have enough funds available in that particular category, don't just throw the expense into a category that you do have money in. Um, I will reject those invoices and some may get through because I'm not perfect. So um, just keep that in mind. Uh, these are your friendly reminders of what is open and what is closing soon. Uh, your FY22 ESEA consolidated funds do um, expire on 9-30-24. You will have until December 30th to invoice for any expenses that occur before 9-30-24. And that is the same with the FY23 tier three school improvement funds as well. We have suspended the federal fiscal office hours for the summer months. We will resume these office hours September 26. Um, anyone who handles federal funds or federal programs 
I encourage you to attend. We share some good information, some essential information for your federal funds. And we are looking for suggestions on topics from you all. So if you could, if you have a question or a topic that you want us to cover, please submit your suggestions to any member of the federal fiscal team by September 1st. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple of final reminders for folks. Um, I'm gonna put a link here in the chat for everyone to have access to, but uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the Maine DOE professional development calendar. Uh, this is an online resource within the state's uh, Department of Education website where folks can access a plethora of different uh, professional development opportunities for themselves and their staff. Um, a lot of great resources and opportunities coming up here over the next couple of months. So uh, if you're in a situation where you might be exploring some options for summer PD, uh, or even if you are in a situation where you have some ESEA funding from prior years um, that you're trying to draw down, uh, definitely take a look at that and see if there might be anything of benefit for you or your staff. And then just to, uh, again, sharing our contact information here, um, you, see, you can see that we've added Shelly uh, as our ESEA Federal Programs Director. Um, all of our contact information is here. If you're relatively new to your role, um, simply take a peek and see what superintendent region your school district falls within. Um, and the individual listed there would be your uh, primary contact for ESEA programming. And then lastly, a number of different options here if you choose to um, engage in social media at all. Um, if you wanna follow the department, you're able to do so um, through these means here. And with that, Rita, I think we can probably pause the recording and we'll kind of open things up for any questions, comments, concerns folks would like to share. 